I'm very grateful for being here to share with you that I live in a country, Uruguay, where about 98% of its electricity is obtained from a combination of different renewable sources. A country whose inhabitants emit 30 times less greenhouse gases than the world average for each kilowatt hour consumed. A country that produces its electricity at a fixed cost, regardless of wars or other geopolitical events, since it is almost independent on energy commodities, dependent just on its wind, its sun, its water, its biomass waste. A country that exports renewable energy surpluses to its two giant neighbors, Argentina and Brazil. When I tell people about Uruguay, they usually say two things. I never heard about it. How did you do it? And can this be replicated elsewhere? So today I want to tell you what happened in Uruguay, how we did it. And yes, even if every country who had to define its own transition journey, the Uruguayan solution can definitely be replicated as well. Fifteen years ago, the Uruguayan energy sector was going to a deep crisis. The economy was growing at unprecedented rates, and poverty was decreasing. It was so great, of course, but at the same time, energy demand was growing rapidly, which was not so great. Uruguay has no proven reserve of fossil fuels. We have already used our large rivers to install hydropower plants, and our two big neighbors were having their own difficulties to supply internal demand, so it was not easy for them to help us. In dry years, when we have to import much more fossil fuels or we were forced to import electricity from our neighbors at extraordinary prices, cost of runs could be as high as $1 billion. And for a small economy like Uruguay, this is 2% of its GDP. And we're still we're beginning to have blackouts. We are living the perfect storm. But crisis is also opportunity. For most of my life, I was a scientist, a particle physicist, doing research on subjects far removed from the everyday world. But in that particular national energy context, I saw the need to reinvent myself, to get involved in the search for solutions. I began to study the energy issue, to organize seminars, to discuss with different experts, and I realized how complex the energy issue is, how many dimensions it has. Technological and economical dimensions, of course, but also environmental, social, geopolitical, cultural, and even ethical dimensions. I started to write down my thoughts, and almost without realizing it, I ended up with a comprehensive, holistic proposal focused on a just transition to renewable energies with very ambitious goals. And one day, when I was in my office at the university, I received an unexpected call. My proposal had reached the president, and he was inviting me to implement it. Imagine my surprise. He was inviting me to be the political head of our national energy agency, what the United States would be the Secretary of Energy. I accepted, and we immediately began to implement that policy. But before the result could be fully seen, there was an election. Fortunately, the new president, José Mujica, was supported of what we had started to do, and he asked me to remain in office. But he asked me one important point, to make this policy to be accepted by all political parties. Patiently, we negotiated with all parties represented in Parliament, and we achieved our goal after accepting some minor changes. Having a long-term policy backed by the entire Uruguayan political system was crucial to make rapid progresses. In just five years, we went from a traditional hydrothermal power mix would have to 50% fossil share to an almost completely decarbonized one that already, in 2017, was 98% renewable. What makes the Uruguayan case unique is that almost half of that electricity is obtained from non-traditional renewable sources, wind, solar and sustainable biomass. Wind alone can produce up to 40% of the total electricity consuming the country in a year, a percentage comparable to the other world wind champion, Denmark. But also 15 or even 20 percent of our electricity is obtained with sustainable biomass. Uruguay is an agro-industrial country with abundant organic waste that has a lot of energy content, like rice hulls, bagasse, black liquors from palm mills. They have now ceased to be an environmental liability to become an energy asset. Of course, none of this was easy. We have to innovate. We have to understand 
that uh, such a power system requires the planning and an operation quite different than the traditional one. Our academics work for years to design a groundbreaking software to handle energy dispatch specifically designed to manage intermittent sources, such as wind and solar, but also how to use water. This model is based on the probability of occurrence of different weather scenarios based on both a century of historical data and weather forecast. This allows us, for example, to have a prediction of the amount of wind electricity and solar electricity that we're going to have in the grid with a week in advance. And this also allows us to know how and when we have to use water from the dams. Thanks to this disruptive methodology, today in Uruguay, intermittent sources are king. The total cell capacity of wind plus solar is of the order of the total country's peak demand. This means that when we have enough wind and solar, almost 100% of our electricity is just from these two sources alone, in addition to biomass fire power plant. And this may happen many times during the course of a week. And in those moments, we don't use water from the dams. Hydropower plants only come into play when the sun goes down or when the wind falls. Our insurance policy, when all else fails, are gas turbines, combined cycle, and enzyme power plant. Yes, of course, flexible fossil fire power plants remain there, but we rely on them very little over the course of a year allowing no renewable electricity to be much more than 2% of the electricity in the grid in a regular year, and sometimes 6 or 7, 7% in a very dry one. And get this, we achieved this goal without any single battery storage, water pumping, or any modern technology for electricity storage. Uruguay has shown that the power mix can work almost exclusively thanks to the complementarity of different renewable sources, independently of their individual intermittency. And this is perhaps the time for you to ask the question, and what happened to the economy? How much did all this cost? And the answer is even more radical. The cost was negative, if I may put it this way. In fact, we get an impressive positive impact to our economy. To begin with, the total cost to produce electricity all over a year was reduced by almost Half. No surprise, renewable energies are the cheapest option today. We went from about $1.1 billion cost to only $600 million today. And this impressive $500 million every year for a country like Uruguay is huge. It's 1% of its GDP. Just for comparison, 1% of United States GDP is about $250 billion annually. Moreover, those tremendous cost overruns that we had in dry years, well, they virtually disappeared. We went from cost overruns of about $1 billion to only 100 to perhaps 200 million a year in a very dry ones. Surprisingly enough, now that we have much more natural sources in the grid, because of their complementarity, we are much less dependent on weather variability. Of course, achieving this tremendous cost reduction was not easy either. We have to innovate also on that. We have to understand that renewable energies require a business model quite different from the traditional one of the power sectors all over the world. We have to create a new market model. Our present business model is based on long-term contracts derived from auction processes in which the percentage of its source is predetermined using an optimization model that defines which is the best technical complementarity between sources in order to minimize the overall cost of the system. Thanks to this, nowadays, almost 100% of our electricity generation is under contract, leaving almost no space for spot market and also no space for uncertainties. The comprehensive model we had defined and put in place not only allows us to strongly reduce the overall cost, but also to stabilize it over time. The cost to produce electricity in Uruguay today is stabilized. I think it is almost independent on the fluctuation of the prices of energy commodities. Thanks to this, for example, 
the Uruguayan electric mix was barely affected by the tragic war in Europe. We had no supply nor affordability difficulties. But the positive economic impact of this transformation went far beyond just the electric sector. We achieved a tremendous impact to our economy. We received $6 billion investment. This is 12% of our GDP. Imagine the impact to our economy. New knowledge, new industrial and entrepreneurial capabilities, 50,000 jobs were created. This seems small, perhaps, for you, but for a country with only 3.4 million inhabitants, you represent 3% of its labor force. Once again, we were made to make a comparison, 3% of the United States labor force is several million new jobs creation. So I told you a little about what happened in Uruguay and how we did it, but you may be thinking, okay, but that's Uruguay, fine, but that's Uruguay, it's a small country. They have a unique culture. They have hydro. Can this be reproduced elsewhere? So I want to be very emphatic on this. Although each country will have to define its own transition process, the vast majority of countries can make a process similar to the Hawaiian one. You don't necessarily need a lot of hydro backup capacity, but for sure, you need to put much more flexibility to your system. With new dispatch model, a new market model. But if you have people and companies doing research and developing AI and artificial intelligence and rockets, developing a new market model, a new energy management shouldn't be that hard. By doing this, we will probably not get the fossil share down to 2%, but for sure it will be below 15 or even 20%, and in many countries, much less than that. And you know what? For the last couple of years after leaving governments, I've been working in, in a number of countries, from Dominican Republic to Chile and many other countries in Latin America, but also in Europe, in other regions. And the good news is that the Uruguayan solution can work in different national and energy contexts. But for that, there is one special ingredient. You need to have a strong leadership, and a strong political will to move forwards. And for that, it's mostly recommended to build a broad political agreement that transcends the administration in office in order to be sure that the transition will continue in time. What is then the most important message for you today? It is very simple. That renewables are no longer just a solution for the climate crisis. Renewables allows us to build strong, reliable, robust, power system. They allow us to sharply reduce and stabilize the electricity cost, while at the same time having an important energy boost to our economies and job creation. Lessons learned from the Uruguayan case is that renewable energies are ripe to provide not just a climate solution on a global scale, but also substantial socioeconomic benefits at a local level. And this can and should happen now. There's no reason to wait until 2040, not even 2030. Now, thank you.